Dr. Judy Lubin, yet another Nobel Prize in Economics for your alma mater, the University of Chicago. But this one is in a field with which you are quite familiar. Who won the prize? It was Richard Thaler, a behavioral economist. Richard Thaler won his award for his contributions to the field of behavioral, behavioral economics. economics. Yes. <laughs> the University of Chicago is a bastion of a way of thinking about economics. And we call it neoclassical economics, or sometimes called the Chicago School of Economic Thought. Milton and Friedman, Milton Friedman, Milton, Uncle, Uncle Milty. We love Uncle Milty. Yes, well, freedom of choice. And the neoclassical style of economics, that's, that's, that is actually what my PhD is in. It does a really good job of understanding markets and um, outcomes, prices, allocations, things that happen as people exchange things and interact. But in order to get there, we made a huge simplification when it comes to people. Classical economics assumes that we are rational actors making informed decisions in search of hedonic gratification. Behavioral economics shows that we are rational actors making informed, oh look, something shiny. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He started the world off trained as a standard traditional neoclassical economist, um, but he was out noticing the world and noticing that people don't act the way he was taught they are supposed to act in their models. So, for example, he noticed one time that he had some friends over for dinner and he had this bowl of nuts and they were eating the nuts and, you know, they were ruining their appetite and they wanted to stop eating the nuts, but they didn't just stop eating the nuts. So he took the bowl of nuts away and hit it and everybody thanked him for it and you know what if you are a neoclassical economist that doesn't make any sense why would you do that if you get utility from eating the nuts eat the nuts there's no right. self-control problem well so it's sort of like odysseus having himself lashed to the mast of the ship so that he I... could hear the sirens because he knew he could not resist the temptation of the sirens and he didn't want to steer the ship into the rocks. Exactly, yeah. and that's people. That's what people do. Now, behavioral economics is mainstream. I'm hoping that you will give us some tips on how to better educate ourselves about behavioral economics. Are there books that you like to read? I loved Nudge. Nudge was uh, 2012, Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein, and it is so applicable in the real world. It's a super simple concept. You've got a choice that you have to make, and, and I care about whether or not you make the choice. If I make it easier for you to make the choice that's best for you, then you'll make that choice. So he calls it choice architecture. One of the more dramatic examples is in organ donations in Europe, as you know. There's some countries in Europe that have like 95% plus rates of organ donation, others where the rates are around 30, 20, and 30%. And the difference is largely that in the countries with high donation rates, the default position is you'll donate and you have to opt out. Whereas the lower rates, when the default is to, the default is to not donate and you have to opt in. And in both cases, most people do nothing. Right. <laughs> and, in the, and in the one case, if you do nothing, you're in. And the other, if you do nothing, you're out. And that's what you mean about choice architecture. Yes. It's the path of least resistance. It's easier for us to do nothing. When you can make doing the right thing the path of least resistance, you have done things the behavioral economic way. Exactly. And, of course, the path of least resistance when I have questions about economics and rocket science is to talk to my dear buddy, Judy Lubin. Judy Lubin, thank you immensely much. Look forward to talking to you soon in Science All right. News. Thank you, Aaron. All right. <laughs>